We had a lot of homicidal maniacs on the island. Uh, an opportunity to be killed just was at every corner. Uh, you couldn't believe it. The confinement, the close confinement, uh, agitated an already bad condition. And uh, we had a lot of men that were, would normally would not have been so dangerous. But on Alcatraz, they had a reputation, so they felt to keep it up. And one of the greatest ways of gaining a reputation was to uh, assault or kill somebody. There were 11 of us uh, imprisoned in McNeil Island, the federal prison in the state of Washington. And we were designated to be transferred to Alcatraz. So we boarded the train that led us down in, came down to Alcatraz. I think it was in Oakland. Uh, the train went out on a dock and the prison uh, boat was there. We went down into the hold of this little boat, 11 people. I can't describe how tight and how narrow it was going down to that little hold. And uh, it wasn't really uh, easy to maneuver with all of the chains around us. When we came from McNeil Island, there were 11 of us chained together. And when the boat docked here on Alcatraz, uh, the bus that they bring us up here in a little jitney had broken down. So at midnight, there were 11 of us dragging our chains all the way up to the top of this hill, a couple of hundred feet up. Uh, the noise was horrendous. The convicts were cussing and guards were telling us to be quiet and there's no way they could control us. So uh, that was a journey I'll never forget. How big of a step can you take when, when you have chains on? Well, probably, probably a foot. There, your, your legs are impeded just a little bit. But the weight of the chains, you know, crotch chains, waist chains, uh, leg irons, and handcuffs. <laughs> So every time I come up here, I think of that. Isn't that a funny idea? We had to spend uh, 30 days in quarantine um, on Broadway, the cells where they had a few cells there. The only entertainment or excitement they have is when a chain comes in, a chain being a group of new prisoners. And they were hooting and screaming and yelling. And a few of the ex-convicts whom I had known before started calling my name out. You know, often again I'm asked uh, uh, what I attributed my uh, criminal crew, my going sour, on. And naturally your family arises. Uh, I think it's more of a mental aberration. I, I know it was in my instance. My dad and mother were just great people. Law abiding, very strict, punish you in a minute. But it was a funny thing that I, out of six children, was the only one that went bad. I never used drugs in my life. I never drank. So I can't blame it on that. I don't really know what triggered that. I wrote a book called From Alcatraz to the White House. <clears throat> and in there I mentioned that I'd started my criminal career at 11. And that really, it really was more of a, of a uh, sort of a bad kid than a criminal career. I started skipping school and fighting and I was very obstreperous. I was a very hard youngster to control. And from that I went to uh, uh, a lot of truancy, then burglary, then car theft, and then into armed robbery. Notwithstanding that I was sent to the Washington State uh, Training School, uh, and from there to, uh, I escaped from that institution, from there to the reformatory at Monroe, and from there to the state prison at Walla Walla. And all of these institutions had marvelous rehabilitation programs. However, I never saw anyone who was rehabilitated because my friends came right up the line with me.
You know, the government, in a lot of respects, had to justify sending certain men here. And uh, they started the rumor that the rumors, rather, that the men who came here were the worst criminals uh, in our society. And I, I agree in a sense that we had many very dangerous people in here, a lot of uh, homicidal maniacs and a lot of just nuts that couldn't get along in the other stu uh, institutions. However, there were a lot of men in here that were not a bit dangerous at all. I, I couldn't, percentage-wise, I would say probably 10 or 15 uh, were sent here simply because they had incurred the, the wrath of the FBI. The FBI made the decision who came here. And uh, as an example, in my case, I had quite a long criminal history, uh, not one of violence, that is in the sense of actually uh, shooting people. And... Uh, but I refused to cooperate with the FBI. There was quite a sum of money they wanted, and I didn't cooperate in any sense. And I caused them quite a bit of trouble. But I knew I was coming here because the agent told me, he said, we've got places for, a place for people like you. Well, that isn't a very a hidden message. And as I kept, when I got here, I talked with many people, and they were told the same thing. We were in the cells, I think around... Uh, 17 to 18 hours a day. On the weekends, uh, we were allowed to go to the yard, short time on Saturdays and Sundays. But the yard was such a horrible place to be. The fog and the cold and the wind blowing the dirt around there. Not too many men went to the yard. This was probably the most miserable area of the institution. Uh, it was always windy, cold, foggy. Uh, contradicting that today, but, and uh, the inmates didn't care for the yard at all, as a whole. The ball park down here was dirt, and the wind would stir up a constant dust and sand, and you're just a little filthy when you got in out of the yard. So it was more, uh, more convenient to just stay in your cell. You get accustomed to stepping three forward and three backward, and your cell is your home. And one of the most injurious things they could do to you as punishment was to move you from one cell to another. That's an odd uh, statement to make, but it's the truth. Nobody wanted to lose his cell. It was his home, and he knew every rivet, every bar, and every metal slat in there. Weren't they all exactly the same? They're all the same, but it wasn't your home. It wasn't your place. When these kids would come in here, uh, they were scared to death. And they wanted to prove that they were tough when they really weren't. And they wanted to prove that they were uh, dangerous. And they wanted to impress the people around the island, the inmates, that don't mess with me. So uh, it even went so far as a number of them would stab another inmate or hit him in the head with a mop handle or a ball bat, any weapon he could to build what they called a reputation. And he felt that now they know I'm a dangerous man not to be fooled with. Well, some of them carried it too far and they killed people. Well, this made them dangerous. And when a reputation of this nature starts, there's always someone else that wants to contest them. And they had better be ready for a life of violence. Uh, there were many fights, there were a number of stabbings in fact, right down in this area below us here was where a man stabbed a guy in the mouth and the throat. I don't know how he lived. I, I was standing right there and watched it. <clears throat> he was the fellow I was telling you about up in the hospital on the operating table. Uh, they rushed him up there and they saved his life. I, I don't know how he ever lived through it, but they did. Were there gangs? No gangs. No, there's no, we didn't gang up in here at all. They wouldn't tolerate that. And, you know, there was, Did they segregate the prisoners by race? The segregation, the segregation was done uh, by the willingness of the inmates. The blacks chose to eat alone, and they chose to sell alone, and they chose, uh, well, not to work alone because they were uh, mixed in with all of us. 
but there was no uh, overt segregation, none that was, uh, that was uh, segregated per se, as we know it now. But the, the blacks did not want to eat with the whites, and the whites did not want to eat with the blacks. Was there racial tensions? Uh, no, it wasn't. I don't think in the years I was here, I probably saw one confrontation between a white prisoner and an inmate, but I'm sure it wasn't a uh, racial situation. You know, with the reputations we had, you couldn't very well say, this guy's a bad guy and the white guy's a good guy. It just isn't so. A lot of rumors come out that uh, the big time gangsters, I was even told that they set up on the upper uh, bleachers and the lower down you were on the social convicts uh, scale, you sat down there and that isn't the truth. You know? I don't know, I think civilians started that. I really do. I never, I never heard of it. The visiting was probably the most difficult part of, uh, of uh, doing the time. The very setup of the visiting room, the, the way they designed it was to really intimidate your visitors and the inmate. They had a little slit of glass you could look through to. Uh, to see the person who you were visiting, and you couldn't really distinguish too well who they were. The visitors were told not to talk about current events, about crime, or anything of that nature. The inmates were, weren't told anything, we just knew better than to do that. And after an hour, the visitor would leave and the old time inmates told me that their visitors were so disturbed and upset that they rarely had, had visits. He couldn't ask them to come back. My mother came here and I asked her never to come back. And that's a hard thing to do. You know, if a man, like I was serving 25 year sentence, I couldn't stand to have him coming back like that. It's too difficult. Did you just try to forget your life before you came in? Yeah, yeah you have to. You have to shut everything out. Creepy Carpus and I used to sit up here on the upper steps just to watch the sights or to talk. And we always enjoyed when the uh, tours would come by, the tour boats. And the loudspeaker would come on and, and uh, he was the most notorious known man here, he and the Birdman. So they would, eventually you would hear them say, well, Alvin Carpus, he was the head of the Ma Barker gang and he was a very dangerous homicidal maniac and he killed 30 or 40 men, all sorts of uh, typical media nonsense. And uh, Alvin would say, gosh, I wish I'd known I did that. And he said, I, I should talk to those people because I don't remember it. And then the boat had gone out of sight and they came around probably eight or nine times a day. Bob Stroud, the Birdman of Alcatraz, uh, I got acquainted with him probably better than any other inmate by virtue of the fact that uh, uh, when I was on Alcatraz, they transferred me to Springfield. I had an injured spine. I'd injured it somewhere along the line. And at that time, they transferred the Birdman to Springfield to die. He was quite ill and he was aged. And I have no doubt that he was a very, very intelligent person but he was a homicidal maniac. He was just as crazy as a loon. He would talk of, um, of crazy things. As an example, he felt all things should be settled by uh, giving the, uh, the adversaries a knife and put them in a room and settle it right there. I had seen a few try it and I'd seen them die, so. That cured me. I never gave, I gave it a thought all the time, but I never made an attempt. Were you here during any of the well-publicized escape attempts? Well, the most publicized, I wasn't here when the two brothers in Anglin uh, tried to escape, but they had about, I can't, maybe six or eight men attempt it while I was here. Uh, half of those were shot to death. And a few of them drowned. No one got off the island. That is, uh, lived to get anywhere other than to go down. 
Do you think the three guys made it? No. No, they didn't make it. What leads you to believe you think they didn't make it? Well, one thing is I know the current, the temperature of the water, and I know the just the conditions and circumstances. And the other is I talked to the mother of... Uh, she came through this prison, and I was autographing my books. And I talked to the mother, and she told me that they were very, very close. So my, my boys and I were very close. They wouldn't go 27 years without contacting me. So she said, I have finally given up. So that was right here in, in Alcatraz, she told me that. So, and then based on what I know, too, you don't disappear. Particularly, they were confirmed bank robbers, and you have to rob to, to live, particularly when you're so well looked for. I worked in the tailor shop for uh, six years. As I always say, I set tailoring back 50 years. Down in these buildings here was the tailor shop, uh, the laundry, the furniture shop, and they had a sock shop where they made just socks. 90%, other than the kitchen people, 90% uh, of the work, uh, the industry work, took place in this long building you see here. Tell us about this area down here, these steps. Well, <clears throat> there are two sets of these steps. This first step takes you to, to the, uh, that was called the search area, the strip and search area, when the prisoners would come up from the, uh, the uh, industry building. There's another just as steep and precipitous as this, going down where that gate is and into, heading in that direction. But up here they had what we call a mechanical stool pigeon, the sort of the thing they use at the, uh, in the airports now. And if you tried to smuggle any metal up, well, a bell would go off. They had it so sensitive, set so sensitively, that the bell would go off when there wasn't anything on your person. So then two guards would step you aside and strip off all your clothes and give you a, what we call a skin search, a thorough search and then let you put your clothes, clothes back on and you could come up into the yard again. Did that happen every day? Oh yes, every, uh, every twice a day. I was never a gangster because uh, uh, that connotes that you, you ganged up with others and I was strictly a loner and uh, I robbed quite a few banks in my time. And uh, I guess that's as far in the gangster era as I ever got. I never dealt with gangs, and I didn't fool around gangsters. I get asked every imaginable question. Uh, the most often is, how much money did you get out of your bank robberies? And I tell them the same thing, that the only one I remember the amount was the one on which I was captured, that I didn't keep books, I had no idea, and I couldn't really accurately tell how many banks I'd robbed. And I would uh, estimate well over 20 banks. The, uh, when I'm asked this question about, did you bury any of the money? I try to hold a straight face and I tell them, well, I buried the greater part of the $50,000. And uh, when I was released, I went out to dig it up and I found out that they had uh, built a freeway over it. People have asked me, weren't you afraid you were going back to prison? Uh, you know, when I committed these crimes and I would tell them uh, the same thing that I'm telling you today. You never, ever will believe you're going to get caught. If you knew it, you wouldn't commit the crime. Every time you design a, a, a new crime or a new method in your mind, you're convinced that this is the one that will, that you'll win. You know, this is the one that, that they'll never catch you. And is that true even after you've been in prison? And oh, yes, and more so. We really delude ourselves. We know all the ropes now. We know all of the answers. And with all of the men with whom I have associated, this is a, 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 just a, a fact. They're not going to catch me. If I thought they were going to catch me, I wouldn't have robbed a bank. If 
I thought there was a chance in the world. And we psych ourselves into believing that at this point, we are invincible. My wife turned me in. Uh, I had robbed that bank, and she waited 90 days and then turned me into the FBI. And uh, I was destined for Alcatraz right from that point on. Why did she turn you in? I, I've never known. She was never abused, never mistreated. That isn't my nature. Uh, and she uh, enjoyed the proceeds of the, uh, of the uh, bank jobs as well as I. So I will never know. I was sentenced to 25 years and a $10,000 fine. And uh, all the way through, I would file a writs of habeas corpus and use every device I could to convince the, uh, the judge that I was tried wrongly, there were flaws in my case, and that I should have been released. Uh, I finally devised a scheme in my mind. Uh, the law reads that there are three separate parts to the law of bank robbery, or to the sentencing. You're sentenced to 10 years for going in with a gun, and that's 10 years. You're sentenced to five for uh, coming out with the money, that's burglary. That's another five. And then you're uh, sentenced for uh, violence using an armed weapon to take the money. So they total that up, you get 25 years normally. Well, it dawned on me after all these years that I wasn't captured for 90 days and they didn't get the gun. And the law says he, that they did commit the robbery with a deadly weapon. So I hit on the idea of filing a habeas corpus uh, proceedings and tell them that I did not use a deadly weapon, I used a plastic weapon. Not dreaming that they would uh, buy that story. But I wanted to cause a lot of trouble and keep filing writs to, just to be alert, to do something. And uh, the federal judge in Seattle said that's a valid reason uh, for habeas corpus consideration, hearing it. And he ordered me brought back to the federal prison and ordered the FBI to produce the handgun. I said I didn't have a deadly weapon. They said I did. Well, naturally, they couldn't prove that I did because the weapon, I tossed it away. I got rid of the weapon, weapon quickly. And the judge ordered my release on, that, on those grounds. So I only really served about 11 years out of 25. I studied law a great deal in the prison. In fact, I got a degree in law from the LaSalle Extension University. Did all inmates have the same opportunity to study the law? Well, it later became that way. Uh, I was the only man on Alcatraz who ever started, uh, was allowed to study law. And I think it was because my dad, who was a little influential, kept putting the pressure. And so I started my studying on Alcatraz. And I continued it through to... Uh, McNeil Island, and when I took my exam, uh, the exam was controlled and heard by Judge John Bone in uh, Tacoma. We're a mile and a quarter from the mainland here, but you just will be 80 miles. It was, it was tough on us, New Year's and Christmas when all the music was going, and, uh, and we knew what was going out on New Year's, and particularly that day and Christmas, and those were hard times for us, the most difficult times that you could ever imagine were Christmas. Uh, some of the men would go in their cells, not come out for two or three days. I have some bad memories. Uh, I think about it a little. Can you really, do you remember it vividly, or does it all seem like a dream now? No, vividly. I even have nightmares about it. When I was released from prison, I organized an agency called the Teen Intercept Corporation, and I worked with kids in trouble. And I was head of that organization for 25 years. A lot of regrets. What would you do different? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be an outlaw. I would live a normal, straight life. 